continuing with our series, My Best Friend, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not some remote part of God, but someone you can have a relationship with. And that's what we've been talking about week in, week out. And I'm so happy today to have my friend, my new friend, uh, Pastor Rick Dykes, who uh, comes from Alabama, and we have a lot of the same circles. We've become friends, and I just love what God is doing in his life and his family's life. And so we're really privileged today to have our cornerstone, Pastor Rick Dykes. Give a warm welcome to Pastor Rick Dykes. God bless you, Cornerstone. Good morning. I hope you're excited to be at church. If I came to your church, I would be excited to come to church every Sunday. This is a great church, and uh, I want you to know that you have a pastor that loves you and um, really does a ton. Uh, it's generally true that your pastor is doing way more than you see. Um, it is a well-known myth that pastors only work on Sundays. That's not true. In fact, yesterday, Pastor Eric did a wedding in the morning. He was at a birthday party, and then he uh, hosted me and took me all over this beautiful state of Connecticut. And uh, I just I love his family. Got to spend time with them as well. Some sharp kids. I think these kids are smarter than me. And I think they knew it when they met me, and I'm just figuring it out, <laughs> which is further indication. But I want you to know your pastor loves you. You need to honor the fact that you have a pastor who is working hard and serving faithfully. So God bless you, Pastor Eric. <laughs> Amen. Well, introduce myself. My name is Rick Dykes. I'm a pastor at a church in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and if I sound funny to you, it's because you have an accent. Um, that's not me. That's you. I'm going to teach you how, the, how our language is supposed to be spoken. I will teach you things like y'all. And God bless you and bless your heart, which, by the way, means I don't like you. If I say bless your heart, that's southern. You know what you guys do here? You say what you mean. That is strange. Stop doing that. Say things like, bless your heart. Don't, don't, don't just speak your mind like that. So I'm in Alabama. I've been married to my lovely wife for six years. We have two young children. In fact, I gave um, the production team a picture. I'd love to show you of my family. Um, I only show you that because they make me look better. It's kind of like if you have a family that's that nice looking, there must be something good about you. And then there's a picture of, of just the kids loving on each other. I mean, look at those guys. I oh, love them. Uh, they are actually joining us online. I would like to welcome those who are joining us online, all of you guys. God bless you. We're so glad that you're here. I think it's so cool that we can do this live, that, that hundreds could be joining us today. Uh, a few weeks ago, Pastor Eric and I were talking, and he said, I want you to come out and speak. And, um, and, and we're in the middle of this Holy, Holy Spirit series, my best friend. He said, but you can preach on whatever you'd like. And I said, I would love nothing more than to help people get to know the person of the Holy Spirit. See, the longer I walk with the Lord, the more I'm realizing I need a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. And for a long time, church has made the Holy Spirit something that it isn't. Something that it isn't. And so I want to begin with a verse from Acts chapter 1. I want to start here just to set a foundation because Jesus had some thoughts on the Holy Spirit for, his, for the people who would build his church. He had thoughts before he ever sent them out. And this is what it says, Acts chapter 1. It says, during the 40 days after he suffered and died, it says he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord... Has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And he replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, Jesus is sitting with his bros. That's what's going down. They're hanging. And if you read that chapter, it's really interesting. Jesus just keeps kind of popping in through walls. He'll be like, boom, I'm here, but peace be with you. Don't do that, Jesus. It makes us nervous. I think he did it just to mess with them. But he shows up, and he gives them instructions, and he says, you've got a mission. There's a plan. There's work for you to do. I came here to pay for salvation. I'm going back to the Father, and when I do, the Holy Spirit will come. But you need to wait for him. Because the thing that I'm calling you to do, and I would say to you, church, in 2016, right now, the work that he has for you to do, you're going to need the Holy Spirit. You're going to need a dynamic relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit who plays a role in our lives 
that nothing else can play. Now, for me, I grew up in church in the South, and the Holy Spirit was made um, very strange. He was either exploited and made strange, or he was ignored altogether. See, in the South, we have a lot of churches, and we have these kind of really small churches and a lot of different denominations, and uh, we have not just small churches, but country churches. There's a difference between living in the country and country. I'm just telling you, those are two different things. Country churches are little tiny churches, kind of out in the woods, and they're small. And I'm telling you, when I say out in the woods, we lived out in the woods growing up. Like, we lived so far in the woods, you had to go towards town to hunt. I mean, that's how far in the country we lived. It's true. And we were poor. Man, we were poor. I mean, we, we really we didn't have much at all, very limited income. I mean, we were so poor, we couldn't pay attention. I mean, it, it, we were broke. I mean, there was nothing going on. But these little churches would become the place where you kind of had your social, your, your social life centered around these little country churches. And though my parents weren't in church and they really didn't take us to church, each of their parents, so my grandparents, went to these two very different churches. And, and this was my experience growing up. One of those churches was very Pentecostal. Like, they thought regular Pentecostals were too mild. They were Pentecostal Pentecostals. They were way out there. Every stereotype you've ever imagined about a Pentecostal, they invented that stereotype. It was real there. And then these other, this other set of grandparents, they went to a, a Baptist, a form of Baptist denomination called the Free Will Baptist. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's small, kind of in the South. I later in life discovered that they call it Free Will Baptist because it's a miracle that anyone of their own free will goes to that church. That's why they call it. That's not true. Um, nobody left, so that's good. Uh, praise God. If I'm going to offend you, I'll do it early, and then we'll move on. But I saw the Holy Spirit either exploited or ignored, and I didn't really know what to do with it. But the truth is this, you guys. The Holy Spirit desires to have a dynamic relationship with you that walks you through every circumstance, everything that you've ever needed. He's not, he's not, a, part of the Holy, he's not a part of the Trinity that, that stopped moving 2,000 years ago to be ignored, and he's certainly not weird to be exploited. In fact, I want you to hear this. The Holy Spirit is not weird. People are weird. People are weird. The Holy Spirit is not weird. In fact, you all know somebody that's weird, don't you? Now, if you don't know somebody that's weird, it's you. You are the weird one, and they're all trying not to look at you right now. So if you feel people not looking at you, it's you. So it's my privilege, though, to introduce you to this God who is not weird. He's not to be ignored. He's not still or he's not he's not done working in the church. And I want to introduce you to him. So my goal is that you would come into a relationship if you haven't already, that you would go deeper with him if you have already. And if you haven't come into a relationship that you would today, my goal is to introduce you to my friend. So I'm going to give you a couple of things about who he is. And then I want to wrap up today with how do you live out a relationship with him? What do I do to have a relationship with this God, with this person of the Holy Spirit? See, the Holy Spirit fills some roles in our lives. First of all, he is to us a comforter. He is a comforter. I've heard it said before, and I'm sure you have too, that every one of us are either in the middle of a crisis, we're coming out of a crisis, or we're getting ready to go into a crisis. And you know that's true. Trouble is coming. You don't have to live long in this world to know trouble is around the corner. And you might say, preacher, can you be more positive? I'm positive. Trouble is coming. It's going to happen. Get ready. But the good news is, with the empowering of the Holy Spirit, with Him close, no matter what we face, we have a comforter. In John chapter 14, Jesus says this in verse 16. He says, and I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper. He will give you another helper. And in the Amplified Bible, in parentheses, it says a comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, a standby, one that would be with you. And it says he will, Jesus says he will be with you forever. You see, no matter what you came in today facing, no matter the hurt, no matter the struggle, whether you, you, you have a loved one who's sick, you have a loved one who's dying or has passed away, no matter your financial situation, if you've lost your job, no matter the hurt, the Holy Spirit will be with you. Three years ago, my papa, I don't know what you call grandparents uh, in New England, but in the South, we call them papas, and that's the proper way to say it. 
Uh, and Papa and I were very close. I grew up in the early years. My dad was military and we moved around a lot. And there were a few seasons where we'd actually have to live with my grandparents because he would be somewhere that we couldn't go with them. And um, I was living, so we lived with Papa a lot growing up, and I spent a lot of time with him, loved my Papa. And in 2013, Papa got very sick, really kind of premature. He's still, still rather young, but he got very sick, uh, actually had a stroke and was in the hospital, and I had an opportunity to go visit him. And, uh, and I went down to visit him, and I'm on staff at this church in Birmingham, and I'm actually leading a ministry where a lot of people are experiencing freedom and healing and I'm going down with this boldness and confidence in the Holy Spirit that, hey, I'm going to lay hands on Papa, and he's going to get up, and he's going to be healed. And this is going to be a great testimony and a great miracle. So I drive down. It's about four hours to uh, my hometown in Mississippi, and I go into the hospital room. Papa's laying there. And um, most of the doctors say that they didn't think that he could comprehend or understand what we were saying. But I went in knowing I'm going to lay hands on Papa, and he's going to heal him. And I went in, I laid hands, and I began to pray. And the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to heal your papa, but not like that. And in a moment, I knew what he meant. That papa was going to go to heaven, that he was going to be restored, that he was going to be made brand new. And by the way, papa knew it. He, was, he, he couldn't say anything. There was no sense of consciousness. And papa would lay there, and he would say, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. And he couldn't comprehend or speak anything else but to worship his Savior. And the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to heal him, but not like that. And he said, these are the last moments you'll get with him. So I sat with Papa, and I prayed, and I talked to him, and I got back in the car and drove back home. And I had so much peace knowing that my Papa was going to heaven, that I wouldn't see him again. Three or four weeks later, Papa was still in the hospital, still alive. I got a free day in ministry, um, which is very rare in ministry. It's kind of like the heavens open, and you know something special is going to happen when you're free for a whole day, you know. And so I, I said to Rachel and my son, Charlie, who was young at the time, uh, I said, we're going to go down. We're going to see Papa today. And as I was getting ready that morning, I remember the Holy Spirit. I, I just asked the Holy Spirit. I said, but you told me I wouldn't see him again. But I'm free today. I'm going down. I called. Everything was fine. I'm going down. So we're driving this three and a half, four hour drive. And we get to Laurel, Mississippi, which is 27 miles from the hospital. And got a phone call that Papa passed away. And the Holy Spirit just said, I told you you'd seen him your last time on earth but you'll see him again. And I walked into the hospital that day where all of the family was mourning because they didn't have hope and they didn't have the comforter and I had peace. And I was able to minister to my family because he gave me peace. Whatever your circumstance today, the comforter will come. He'll draw close. He has that role in your life. The Holy Spirit's also an empowerer. You know, he gives us strength. He gives us the confidence and the boldness and the strength and the power. He gives us giftings to handle the hard things of life. You know, the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So we should be full of joy, right? We should be strong and full of joy. Well, I've seen some Christians that look like they could be mugged by a butterfly. Like they are not looking very strong. They look mad. Why do Christians look so mad? The Holy Spirit has empowered us to overcome every circumstance in this life. He has gifted us, and they look so angry. The Bible says the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you right now. Whatever force and power it took to raise Jesus Christ from the grave is alive in you. That's an empowerment that you can't get from anywhere else. We ought to be so full of joy that in worship... We smile like something is wrong with us. You ever see somebody smiling so much something has to be wrong? I want that to be said about me. And y'all are thinking, you do look like something's a little wrong. And that's okay. God bless you. Bless your heart. <laughs> mm. That was a word from the Lord. In that passage in Acts, it says that, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. The Spirit gives gifts. It's called a charis, a grace gift. He has empowered you with something that is supernatural to you for your circumstance and your situation. He empowers you to be an overcomer in this life. My sweet daughter, we named her Charis. The picture you saw, many of you may have noticed that she looks a lot like me. And so every day I pray that she would be empowered to be an overcomer and that she would get over that struggle in her life. She's going to be okay, y'all. Amen. 
because she's empowered. And every one of us, see, there's an anointing that's on you that comes from the Father to overcome everything. And not only to overcome, but to be a conqueror. The Bible says that you're more than a conqueror, that you're an overcomer, that you are going to do great things, that he will make every circumstance. He'll turn it all around and make it good for you. He's going to empower you to do that. So he comforts, he empowers, he teaches. The Holy Spirit is a teacher in our lives. He's our source of wisdom. Recently, I was, th- I was reading a, a book on wisdom, and it said that wisdom is the difference that allows a person to discern good from best. Have you ever thought about what your life would look like if you weren't just making good decisions in your circumstances, but you were making the best decision in your circumstances? You, you, many of you have experienced the difference between good and best. Some things are good, and some things are the best. What would happen in your job, in your marriage, in your relationship with your children if you had the wisdom to know what's best? John 14, 26, Jesus says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. You know, the Lord will call to mind circumstances from your past and and victories from your past. And he'll give you a revelation of your future even to help you make the right decision. See, the Holy Spirit will lead you in that. And when you're making best decisions over good decisions, see, the Holy Spirit is taking you somewhere because he sees the future and he knows what's coming. And when you're in relationship with him, you hear his voice. 1 Corinthians 2 says, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For listen to this. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, even the deep things of God, the Bible says. The depths of God... The Holy Spirit searches and reveals it to you. In one place it says, if you'll call to me, if you'll call to me, it says, I will reveal to you deep and unsearchable things. In other words, there are questions that you're not, you don't even have enough information to ask the question and the Holy Spirit has the answer. He's a teacher who will help you live your life. He's going to comfort you in the hard times, strengthen you to have victory in every circumstance, teach you to make the right decisions. And then you know what else? He's an intercessor. The Holy Spirit stands. You know what an intercessor is? This is, um, th- this is just a simple definition. An intercessor says, I see the problem, and I know the one who has the answer. I'm going to take the problem to the throne, and I'm going to get an answer to the problem. My friend needs healing, and I know the healer. My friend needs a job, and I know the one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. An intercessor stands in the middle, and guess what? The Bible says the Holy Spirit is your personal intercessor. Do you know what a travesty it would be that you go your whole life without a relationship with the one who knows the Father the best and is willing to pray for you the most? The Holy Spirit wants to pray for you. In fact, in Romans 8, it says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Have you ever been in a circumstance where you didn't know what to pray? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit knows. The Holy Spirit knows a perfect prayer. And when you're in relationship with him, when you're in relationship with him, he'll do that for you. He'll take it to the Father on your behalf. So here's the question that has to be asked. It's like, yeah, Pastor Rick, I, I hear you. That's cool. I want that. But I don't know how to get there. And it may be because you've had some experiences in your past. It may be because nobody's ever taught you. But I want to tell you that there is good news. The Holy Spirit wants that relationship with you too. He longs for it. In fact, Paul wrapped up his second letter to the Corinthians and he wrote these words. This is from the message, but I love this language. It says, May the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit desires to have that relationship with you. So the, so the question just has to be, how do I get there? How do, I, how do I have that relationship, this intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit? So I want to give you, as we wrap up today, just a few simple things. Just a few simple solutions. The first thing is this. We have to surrender our lives. The Bible says this in Acts chapter 7. You stubborn people. You are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. One translation says you stiff-necked people. 
You ever seen somebody with a stiff neck? Like they're getting ready to land a 747 up their nose? If pride keeps you from a relationship with the Holy Spirit, that is a travesty. You are not good enough to lead your life. You don't know enough to lead your life. Every, and let me say it this way. Every area that you maintain control in, the Holy Spirit won't move in. Let me say it again. Every area that you maintain control in, the Holy Spirit won't move in. Because He's gentle. He's going to lead where He's invited to lead. But He's not going to push. And if you're holding on to it in your own pride, we cannot let pride and arrogance keep us from that. Just get out of our own way. A lot of times, in a lot of places in our life, the Holy Spirit's just waiting on us to say, Hey, I've been trying this, but I don't think I can do it. And, and I release it. See, anything that you hold lightly, this is a kingdom principle, this is bonus. Anything that you hold lightly, the Lord will, will let you keep and he'll give you more. Anything that you hold tightly is only as big as you can handle. When you hold it loose, the Lord will anoint it and bless it and it'll grow. When you hold it tight, it'll die. We've got to surrender our lives. Secondly, we have to deal with the grieving of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 4, it says this, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So two things. First of all, your relationships with people have to be healthy. And the number one thing that keeps relationships with people from being healthy is unforgiveness. I, I want to tell you that uh, as a the part of the ministry that I've been doing for the last five years, I've seen so many people delivered from so much bondage in their life. And, and one of the biggest things that they've had to learn is that I can't hold what this person did so tightly that I can't hold on to the thing that the Lord wants to do in my life. See, we were created to be conduits, to be a flow through of grace and love of the Father. And when there's a, when there's a blockage of unforgiveness, the, the flow stops. It stops at the blockage, and our heart doesn't receive, and others don't receive. And I'm not saying that what they did to you was right. It wasn't right. It doesn't validate it. It doesn't make them. They don't have to apologize for you to forgive them. You just have to let go and let the Lord deal with that. Because your relationship with Him is more important than vengeance. Your relationship with Him is more important than justice. He is the one who holds justice, and He cares more about you then you will ever know he loves you. He wants you to have that relationship. And please, please, please hear me. Don't let unforgiveness keep you from that. It's not worth it. Unforgiveness grieves the Father. It damages the relationship. Jesus even said, hey, if you're at the altar and you're ready to make a sacrifice to the Father, but you've got a, you've got a burden with a brother, if something's going on with a brother, you lay the offering down. You don't even make that sacrifice. And you go deal with the situation with your brother. And then you come back. You know why? Because an offering, a sacrifice, giving can't even be done in the right heart if we have a fence with someone else. He wants our hearts pure before him so that we can receive all that he has. And another way that we grieve the Holy Spirit is, is when we have un, unrepentant sin in our lives. And unrepentant sin is just this. The Holy Spirit is telling you you need to change direction in this area, and you keep going that way. It's that, it's that gentle conviction that the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And here's the thing. Your sin doesn't make God love you less. Somebody needs to hear that today. God loves you so much. You know, when my son sins, I don't love him less. But I recognize that when his heart is turned away from me, we can't have the right kind of relationship. So I want him to be obedient, and I want him to, be, to, to live the right kind of life so that we can have a great relationship. The Heavenly Father is no different. Sin, repenting from sin is just because the Holy Spirit realizes, hey, if your heart is turned towards that, it can't be turned towards me. It's why Jesus says no one can serve two masters. You can't look at that and look at me. You can't serve us both. And so the Holy Spirit just, just, just touches your heart and says, hey, will you turn back? Will you just turn back? And listen, the motivation for living a godly life isn't to keep God from being mad at you. The motivation to live a godly life is to be in relationship with him. Think about it this way. My motivation to stay faithful to my wife isn't just so that she doesn't kill me in my sleep. 
although that may happen. She would probably say, bless your heart, when it was done. <laughs> it's so that I have a love relationship with her that stays pure. And none of us doubt that. Every one of us understand that analogy, that picture. I want to stay faithful to her because I want to be close to her. I don't want something coming between us. It's the same thing with the Father. Don't beat yourself up if there's sin in your life. Just know that the Lord loves you enough to turn you away from that so that you can be turned back towards Him. So, so we deal with, we surrender our lives, we deal with the grievances in our lives by forgiving and repenting. And then listen, quiet yourself. See, in our culture, we get uncomfortable with silence. The Lord really likes it when we sit quietly with him. See, he has a place to, he, he has something to say, and he wants you to go to a place that's quiet occasionally. Just sit with him in a quiet place. In Luke 4, it says this, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, and then it says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. I don't know if you've ever been in the wilderness, but it's quiet. There's not a whole lot going on. It's quiet. It's still. There's a passage in 1 Kings 19 about the prophet Elijah who is, he's, he's worried about a situation. And he's saying, God, help me. God, show me. God, speak to me. Show me yourself. Show me yourself. Show me yourself. And the Lord says this, go out and stand before me on the mountain. Get to a quiet place. Go out there. And then as Elijah stood there, it says, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. It says, after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire there was the sound of a gentle whisper. The King James says, a still, small voice. Get to a quiet place. See, our ears are tuned for the windstorm and the earthquake. And when it's like that, we can't hear the whisper. When our ears are tuned for the earthquake and the windstorm, we can't hear the whisper. We need to learn the discipline of just sitting quietly before the Lord. God said, go to the mountain. He sent Elijah to a quiet place, and then he showed up in the, sound, in the form of a gentle whisper. So we get quiet before him. Then, then, then listen, guys, you've got to invite the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit's not a party crasher. He didn't just show up. I kind of just show up. You throw a party and there's food. I might be there. You might think I'm in Birmingham and I'm at your house because there's cake. It's your fault. You put it on social media, you served cake. I'm here. Party. The Holy Spirit doesn't show up at your party. The Holy Spirit wants to be invited. He longs for a relationship with you. He's not going to force himself on you. That's not how relationships are done. He wants to come in because you want him there. He's a gift from the Father. He's not forced on you. He's a gift to be received. Luke 11 says, If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give you the gift of the Holy Spirit if you ask? If you ask, if you invite Him, you'll get it. So you say, Pastor Rick, how do I have this relationship? Listen, it's, it's so simple. It's not always easy, but it's really simple. Let go of things. Surrender. Deal with the stuff in your heart. Forgive people. It's not worth it. Turn away from your sin. Quiet yourself down and invite him in. And then listen, when he gets there, uh, this is, revel- is going to blow your mind. When the Holy Spirit shows up in your life, talk to him. Talk to him. Oh, that the church would know that the Holy Spirit longs to hear from you. He wants to know. And there's nothing too great, too bad, too hurtful. There's nothing you can't tell him. Somebody told me one time, as a leader in the church, you be strong before your team and broken before the Lord. Be honest before the Lord. Tell him how you really feel. He's okay with that. You know, he can handle that. There's a situation in our family that's, it's a, it's a big change. It's a big turn of events. There, there's something new happening. And last night I was with the Lord and, just worshiping and this this season of life has drawn me closer to him you know a three-year-old and a one-year-old would do that to you praise God and I was praying and I said you know I said God I'm scared but I trust you I'm scared but I trust you and immediately that gentle whisper said 
You can't be scared and trust. Just trust. And I say the same to you. No matter the circumstance, if you'll talk to the Lord, 1 Peter 5 says, cast all your anxiety, all of your cares, cast it on him. He cares for you. He is a person, and he longs to hear from you. And I'm telling you, your greatest moments in the, in the presence will be the ones that you're most honest with him. When you get quiet, you deal with your heart, and you surrender your life, you get quiet, you invite him, and you talk. You say, Holy Spirit, come sit with me. I need to tell you some things. Here's the beautiful thing. His calendar is always open. All day, every day, any day, no matter the time of day. And imagine this. What would your life look like if you were walking daily in the quietness of the morning with the Holy Spirit, the one who comforts, the one who strengthens and empowers, who teaches and who prays on your behalf? What would your life look like? Hey, better yet, what would the world look like if the church did that? Because we're the hope of this world. You are the hope. The local church is the hope of the world. What would it be like if every one of us, if we sat with the Lord daily, heard from him, and then went out into the world to be a blessing? So I want you to bow your heads, and I want you to close your eyes. I want to pray for you. And if you're here today, and you say, you know what, that sounds great, but I don't even know that my salvation is settled. Because Jesus Christ came, and he dealt with that, and and he wants to deal with that first. So if you're here, and you know you have never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ and surrender your life to him, I want to give you a chance to do that first. So in just a second, I'm going to count to three, and I want you to raise your hands very quickly. I'm not going to take a lot of time here, but if you know that you're hearing from the Lord, he's drawing you close, he's saying, invite me, I want you to lift your hands on the count of three. One, two, three. I want Jesus to be my Savior. God bless you, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praise God. I see hands throughout the room. Even if you're joining us online, you, you lift your hand right there with the Lord. I want to pray this with you, and then I'm going to pray with those who say, hey, I'm, I, know, I know my salvation is settled in Jesus, but I want to go deeper with the Holy Spirit. Now, if that's you, I want you to lift your hands. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. I want to go deeper with the Holy Spirit. Praise God all over the room. We're going to walk close with the God who loves us and has called us in Jesus' name. So let me pray for you who are ready to receive Jesus. You pray this in your heart or out loud, in your words or mine. doesn't matter. You just mean it in your heart. Father, I repent from trying to do life my own way. And I say that your way is better. Thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, I receive all that you did for me on the cross. I declare that you are my Savior, that you are Lord of my life. And Father, I receive new life in your Son, Jesus Christ. And I give my old life to you. And I choose to follow you in Jesus' name. Now, for those of you who said, I want to pray for the Holy Spirit, open your hands. Before the Lord, I'm going to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, let your spirit just flow out on Cornerstone Church. I pray, God, that let, let Connecticut never be the same because of church, because of Cornerstone Church, because church is empowered with the spirit. I pray, God, that my brothers and sisters who are in Christ Jesus would walk with your Holy Spirit, that the anointing would settle on them, God, in ways that they've never imagined, that in the darkest moments they would have the most light, that when when things are the hardest, that they would have the most peace, God. I pray for your presence in their lives. I pray for a supernatural empowerment. No matter the next season, God, let it be full of grace, full of your glory, God, and full, most of all, of your Spirit. And we give you all the glory. And the church said... Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rick. I appreciate that word this morning. It was encouraging. Sharing your heart. Not like sharing the heart. Listen, we want to encourage you today. We want to have it. Please, all you could stand. We want to open the front of the church. We call it the altar area. And ask the prayer team to make their way down. If you'd like to get prayer. If you pray that prayer today, that I gave my life to Christ, could you do us a favor? We want to be able to help you and assist you. If you could fill out this card, say, I've accepted today my life to Jesus Christ. If you could put it, give it to one of the folks in front or one of the receptacles, the wooden boxes as we leave today, that would be great. Also, I want to encourage you, if you made that decision today, we have Growth Track Step 2, Connecting to Christ. Right after, on the right-hand side, we have a lunch and everything available for you, lunch and uh, child care. Love to have you come. It starts at 1230. You have a little time to get ready for that. Okay, everybody? They're going to end in a... And the worship song. Thank you. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything.
everything I need. Everything I need. Oh, in Christ is enough. you and keep you. Me going is peace. Listen, we're going to lead this open here in front of you. You need prayer. Listen, we want to join together with you and pray for anything you need. We're all family here. And sometimes you need someone to hold your hand or pray with you and say, will you come in agreement with me? We're going to lead this open and have quiet music playing. Otherwise, we dismiss you. Love to have you come to Grove Track. You haven't come. We have extra spaces. We'd love to have you come. Thank you, everybody. God bless you.